I want those to keep going to be in charge of our live stream on Instagram. We're going to be doing that as well. So that way you have, um, you have, um, both. I'm just trying to get the Instagram live going here, fellas. Give me a second. All right. And meanwhile, you guys know you can ask all the questions in the chat. Any kind of questions, technique, you know, weight cut, strategy, rules, mindset, anything you guys want, really. All right. We're going live here. And Lando, you're going to be in charge of the phone, okay? So you can hold it, move it around. Well, I just, yeah, it's, it's live. All right. And, um, until we get a question here. All right, team, we're waiting on questions. Who's first? Guys, for those of you who are on the internet, remember on Instagram, we're only doing uh, questions for those who are on our YouTube channel. So if you want to ask questions, you got to go um, on uh, our virtual academy, right? Uh, Drysdale BJJ Virtual Academy uh, on YouTube, and then subscribe, and then you guys can ask questions, okay? All right, team. A lot of people in here, not enough questions. I'm just going to continue from where we left off yesterday, unless you guys got something to ask. Anything? All right, Lando, we're going to start with um, – we're going to continue with that uh, – uh, uh, with uh, some details here on the De La Hiva. I got I was getting that question yesterday. We didn't have time to answer it. That's the only one I can recall from memory. So we're going to continue. Oh, the questions are coming in now. So I'm just going to show this De La Hiva one really quick because it was a uh, um, uh, it was a question we had yesterday. It's the one I remember. So stand up really quick. So the question is the difference between this grip on the De La Hiva. And this grip, right? Which one's better? And why do you, why would I use the heel? And why would I use the the pocket grip? One advantage of the pocket grip is that it's harder to break, right? This right here is more likely to slip than this right here is to break. On the other hand, I'm actually holding on to his legs, so I have a little more contact here with his legs, a little more friction in the sense where I'm actually controlling his leg. Whereas here, his foot can move around. So, for example. If he wants to start like moving his foot to the outside, I don't like put your foot out. Like I can't really stop from moving the foot. Whereas here, if he wants to do that, I can just push. I can pull his foot. So if you try to open your knee, he can't do it because there's more pressure on the knee here than there is here, right? Like no matter how much pressure I put here, he can always open up that foot because I'm not attached to it, right? So that's one one uh, one difference. The other thing to watch out for is that here, like because my hand is open in this direction, right? Like I, I'm not, I'm only blocking his foot from going that way. If Lando wants to move his foot to the inside that way towards the wall, it's I can't really stop him. I guess sometimes he can follow, but it's hard. Whereas here, I can always stop him from knee slicing. So if you want a knee slice there, you can see how I keep his leg on this side. If his leg is always on this side, how he's gonna, how is he gonna knee cut on that side over there? You see, like where his legs go make a difference so if he's in here and his legs attached to this side he can't knee cut right he has to step a little bit closer to that side to knee cut but if i have his leg trapped over here right how are you going to knee cut over there you see how he can't knee cut so this is a very effective way of stopping your opponent from knee cutting i like it um i use both i originally was taught this i use this for most of my career in recent years, the last like five, ten years, you've been seeing people adapt to this right here. There are some advantages and some disadvantages to this. You do see a lot of people who prefer uh, uh, the short De La Hiva hook, which is another difference on the De La Hiva, is this right here. All right? A short De La Hiva for people with shorter legs and a long De La Hiva for people with longer legs. I can see why, because if you if you don't if you have like shorter legs, if you can't play the long de la hiva, I can see why people will prefer this right here. Because I can't I, I don't get enough control over him by by having this right here. And I can't extend my leg anyway because my leg is too short. So I understand why they prefer this right here. Whereas when I have this, I always have the option of fully extending my leg. So the heel control makes a little more sense. Okay. Um I recommend both. It depends what kind of De La Hiva you play. Once again, if you're playing the short De La Hiva hook, the pocket grip is more common. When you're playing the long De La Hiva hook, which is the original, it is a little more common to use the uh, um, grabbing the heel, right? So once again, in jiu-jitsu, there's no such thing as right and wrong. There's only what you prefer, what works best for you. 
uh, Jiu-Jitsu is one of the few uh, sports in the world that you can actually adapt, right? You can go from you – can, you can adapt to your body type. So if you're tall, you can make it work for you. If you're short, you can make it work for you. It doesn't really matter. All right, so Lisa has a question. What causes blue belts to quit? Very good question. I love this one. Why is there such high turnover rates for attendance as well as gyms? What questions should you ask when considering a gym? Okay, it's, let's go one at a time. So why do blue belts quit? I suspect why. Showing up to the gym every day, you know, unless you're really, really into it, is not exactly easy. We have like busy lives, job, family, a number of reasons that keep us at home, right? But you love jujitsu and it's part of your life and you like the fact that it's part of your identity. When your conversation comes up, you know, in the UFC or watching UFC in the living room with a bunch of friends, someone's going to bring up, oh, you used to train that stuff. Did you You train that UFC stuff? And you want to say, yeah, I trained Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And then they're gonna, someone in the room is going to ask you, what belt are you? And you're going to go white belt. That's not very – it sounds like you don't know what you're talking about, right? But when you say blue belt, most people don't even know the rank. They can't tell the difference between a blue and a brown belt. So they say, oh, blue belt, okay, this sounds like this person knows what they're talk about, talking about, right? So there's a little bit of prestige when, in terms of, uh, um, in terms of uh, you know, being a blue belt over a white belt. There's a big difference, right? So when people, you know, if they're on the verge of quitting, they know they're not going to last in jiu-jitsu, they get their blue belts in their stock. It's very common. But they, for the rest of their life, they have a little bit of an aura of expertise because they're a blue belt. Now, if you train jiu-jitsu every day, it doesn't sound like a lot. But if you're talking to the average person who has no idea about the BJJ uh, lifestyle and community and world and what it means to be a blue belt and how hard it is, it sounds like you're an expert. So the next time you're watching UFC with your friends, you can brag about knowing what's going on, which you probably do. Um, you know, it just doesn't really make you an expert on the ground, right? Okay. Uh, attendance is okay for attendance. What questions should you ask when considering a gym? I don't, I, I wouldn't recommend people asking questions when joining a gym. What you really want to be doing is making sure you like the culture. Like when you walk in, do you feel threatened? Do you feel it's a happy environment? Do you feel it's a place where you belong? Do you feel it's a place where, you know, like you would want your kids to attend and bring your wife or your husband? Would you, you know, do you feel like that's the kind of environment that you think is nurturing, that is friendly, that is um, a healthy environment, right? Like these are the things I'm really looking for. Like, I, not, not only, you know, obviously, you know, who your instructor is and his technical level. It just depends on what you're looking for. Like if you're looking for I want to be a world-class competitor, you want to be in a gym where that has like, you know, a lot of competitors. If you want to be, I just want to be, you know, fit and I just have a good time, you're probably looking for a more family feel environment, right? The problem is most gyms will have that family feel. And I'm saying as a business owner, it's actually better for business. You know, cultivating the competition culture inside the gym is actually really tough for business. There's prestige into that. But like financially speaking, it's, it's a nightmare because most competitors can't pay. So, you know, so most gyms are going to lean towards a family environment. I've worked really hard to create both. I've tried to like juggle the two and it's, it's not always easy, right, to cultivate, you know, like that, that competition culture, but also to make an environment where everyone is, is very friendly to one another. Uh, because at the end of the day, competitors tend to think, you know, a little too much of themselves. They don't see themselves as the normal student. They see themselves as a little bit above everyone else. Like, I'm, you know, I'm really not like you. I'm, I'm a competitor. You know, I placed in two IBJJF tournaments. Like, no one says it because it's embarrassing to say it, but it's what's in the background. Like, they're thinking it. Uh, all right. So that, I would just, like, experience the culture. Like, when picking a gym, I would really just try to hang out in the gym as much as possible. If you get a free week, enjoy that free week and see – you know, if it's the right fit for you. All right. In competition, do you like to use a specific strategy or do you go with the flow and play dynamic? That's from Cameron Taylor. In competition, I always have a game plan. You don't ever want to enter competition without knowing what you're doing. You don't go to war not knowing what your opponent's tactics are, what their strengths are, what the terrain is, what's the weather. Like, you, you want to know everything. It's the more intel you have when going into combat, the better. It drives me nuts when people would say, Rob, I get too nervous about, you know, if I look at my bracket, I don't want to look at the bracket. I just want to go and fight. To me, that's so unprofessional. It's very amateurish. And it's very common in, in BJJ to have that sort of approach. You know, they, they're going against their opponents and they have no idea what their opponents are good at. I don't recommend that. I don't teach that. I think that you should study your bracket. You should know exactly what you are. Thank you, Orlando. You should know exactly what you're going to be doing walking in there and not, um, 
you know, and not 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 just be going at random. So game plan. What's the game plan? It depends, like what division you're in. Uh, for example, in the heavier divisions, you're going to be a little more stand standing uh, oriented. If you're in the lighter divisions, there's going to be a lot more guard pulling, right? So um, you just got to flip the camera yeah. around, yeah. And uh, get that thing out of the way too. That's the arrow. There we go. And um, you see what I'm saying? So it depends on what what your the, 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 the every division has its own personality. That's how I like to look at it. So there's a certain Certain things are going to work really well in the really light divisions, and certain things are going to work really well in the heavier divisions. So you got to know what those things are, and then you know you got to look at yourself and go an honest look at yourself and say, I have really good stand up, I have really bad stand up, or my stand up is mediocre, but it's better than that guy, and I'd rather be on top, so I'm going to stand up with it. So you start creating strategies based off of this intel, right? This this information you have of not only yourself but also your opponent. Very important. You walk in there with a game plan. Rob, I don't know my entire division. Well, you should. If you don't have that information available, you can't find it anywhere, then, you know, in that case, you just impose your will. That's how I've always my approach. If I don't know someone or I have no idea what they're capable of, normally happens at the lower ranks, like white, blue, sometimes purple, brown and black, you know each other. You know who's who. Well, you should at least, right? You've been competing. If you're a brown belt, you should be familiar enough with, with your, your division to know who's who and what they do. But if you don't, you want to walk in there and pose your will. Like, this is what I do. I got a good closed guard. That's what I'm going for. I have good stand-up. I'm going to stand up. I got a really good low single. That's what you should shoot. You shouldn't think so much about what they do. Just focus more on what you're good at. Unless you find someone that, like, is, you know, this doesn't happen anymore. But back in the day, they like, judokas would walk in with a judogi. It was just, like, so obvious. Even the way they warmed up, you could tell. You know, sometimes you can tell it's the wrestler by the way they warm up. Sometimes you can tell it's a good guard player, like close guard and triangles, by their height. You see someone really tall and skinny, guess what? They're probably good at triangles, right? Uh, little things like that. You know, you become better at observing these things. I would look at the size of their ankles a lot of times. Like, some of people like really big ankles. I don't have huge ankles for my height. But people with really big ankles, they're more resilient to foot locks. It's true. Like the bigger the joint, the more damage it can take. So I would look at their ankles and I go, I can, I can foot lock that guy or I can't foot lock that guy. Same thing with the wrists. Like people with bigger wrists are harder wrist lock. It's, it's like little small pieces of information. Is this person nervous? If I could see that they're nervous, I would try to act. You always try to act confident, you know, but I almost like – try to, you know, almost like try to play that against them, like show them that I'm not scared of them at all because I would want to, I want to use their insecurity against them. So any piece of information you can gather before a match is relevant. You know, jujitsu is not just a technique. There's, so it's almost like psychological warfare, which is one reason why I never talk to opponents before a match. To me, it's a sign of weakness. I never do it. No recommend it. After you guys can go eat dinner together, hang out, party, do whatever you want. Before a match, don't talk to your opponent. You don't look at them. You know, you got to be like really cold in, in, in general and just like very, very like like a poker face, like the whole time. Give them absolutely nothing because any sign of emotion can show weakness, right? And even if it doesn't really make you weak, it sometimes boosts their confidence. They might be very insecure about fighting you. Next thing you know, they become very uh, confident, right? Okay, this is from uh, Nick McFarlane. What good? What are good guards for a short, stocky person? Who are some good short, stocky competitors to watch? Okay, uh, for short and stocky people, it's the same one for ultra heavyweights. It's the deep half guard. You can use the coyote guard, like the underhook, and sit it up. That's going to work. Deep half guard is going to neutralize your opponents a lot. Yesterday, for those of you who were watching, I was showing my favorite deep half guard sweep, which is not great for people who are like, you know, heavy centered because it's a back take. It's not really a sweep from deep half guard. But today I'm going to show you guys a sweep that uh, a transition that can work really well for short and stocky people. So I'll show it to you guys. I actually learned this one from uh, Ryan Hall like when he visited our gym years ago, and I, I, I still use it to this day. It's very simple. It was a very easy transition. I'll just move over here a little bit more. When I move into a deep half guard, see how I'm facing this direction? I'm going to pull him on top of me as I get both my kneecaps to face the opposite direction. And I'm only like hitting him in the butt, so I turn away. So once I'm looking away, I'm going to turn. You guys can see I have all sorts of different fun options, right? One thing that's very important in a deep half guard is that you know, you keep your knees, your feet off the ground. If you got really short legs, all, his legs are really long. Sometimes you can get away with this. But for the most part, you have to bring your legs up so he doesn't pull his ankle out. 
Also notice that I use his leg as a pillow. It's very important. I don't want him stepping over my, uh, uh, my head unless that's, that's what I want him to do. It depends on what you're looking for. But what I'm going to be doing is I can use my hand here is I'm moving this foot to my left hand and I'm going to lace it with the back of the hand. You guys see that? So it's like that waiter sweep from deep half guard that everyone knows. I'm just going to show you guys a little transition here that, that uh, uh, works really well, especially if you have short legs. So I'm, I'm assuming that's your body type, like short and stocky. And I lace that leg with the back of my, uh, uh, of my hand. And when I'm going for this, I have to fish. You guys can't leave your foot dangling out there too much because you might go for a foot lock. But just like enough, if you feel in danger, you can always cross this way to protect the foot. But I have to get that knee in there. The longer you are, the harder this is to do, okay? But you see how I got my right knee behind his knee? And my left knee bites his foot. So he's stuck here. It feels like, oh, he can free that leg. Like I got a really good position here. In fact, I could sweep him with this one. But I'm assuming that, you know, I just, we're just going to go for the transition that, that I'm going to show you guys that, which is pretty simple. This is the hardest part right here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lift – and I'm going to get my other leg on the other side, except that I'm going to keep holding the foot. Okay, so basically I got both my shins on his calf. What that does is it stops him from – he can't really step out of it. I hold the foot to the whole time. So he's kind of stuck, and if he insists, I'm going to sweep him. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to kick the left, the right leg on the inside. So the, out, the leg is on the outside. In this case, my right leg, I thread to the inside, and I transition to what? To a 50-50. Now from here – it's a very easy way to, I mean, it's easy to come up because they're falling back and the momentum of them falling back should pull you on top of them. Okay. So one more time. I'm in here. Raise. So when I, I, have, I, I use my hand, but I got to get my right leg underneath his knee. And then I pummel with the other leg. And I keep holding onto the foot. Whenever I'm ready, I lift and I thread the inside leg as I bump the foot to the other side. It shouldn't be hard for me to come up if I'm using the momentum from the sweep in order to get on top of them. So that's one idea uh, from that deep half guard. But, you know, to answer your question, 100% I want you guys using the deep half uh, – the, the, if you're short and stocky, deep half guard and half guard are the best guards for you. Open guard – I mean, if you've got very light hips, right, you can, uh, it's always easier to play uh, open guard when you have, like, skinny legs and light hips. If you have a heavy centered, big legs, I don't recommend it at all. Okay, next question. Okay, this is from Luke. Hayabusa Luke. Well, lots of talk, uh, lots of talk of gyms reopening soon. What precautions should gyms be taking? Honestly, man, I'm, I don't have any great ideas for as far as precautions. I think that there's no such thing as social distancing with BJJ. We are the opposite of social distancing. Who are we kidding? We're in each other's face trying to choke each other out, like trying to we're, – we're breathing in each other's face the whole time. It's, it's There's no social distancing. I don't know what the regulations are be are going to be in the future, uh, you know, when we do open up. I think that there might be a limit of how many people are in the gym. I think that might be a solution. So what we're going to do is um, we might have, like, time slots. I thought about that. I don't know if it's going to work, but we have, like, time slots from 6 a.m. to midnight – and we'll have groups of 10 people that are going to be training for like an hour. Everyone gets an hour, those groups of 10 people, like from 6 a.m. all the way to midnight. And it's the same 10 people or five people, however number of people they allow. And it would be difficult to have an instructor for all those classes, right? So what I'm thinking about doing is writing a program and, you know, selecting one person every time slot to run the class within that time slot every day. And I'd write the program every evening. And it'd be up on the wall every morning at the gym. So people just follow the program. It's, it, it is as if I were teaching the class, except that the highest ranking person in the class is the one that's going to be um, uh, teaching it. Guys, just so everyone on Instagram, I'm not answering questions on Instagram. Guys, you got to go on the on the, uh, the, the the YouTube channel. It's uh, Dryzo Virtual Academy. If you, if you search Dryzo BJJ online, it's going to come up. Um, just go on there, subscribe, and then you can ask questions, okay? It's just too many platforms for me to respond to, so we're just using uh, YouTube for now. Okay, uh, next one. Can you, uh, Mariana Bowen, can you please show the breaking China wall pass from open guard, the shake and the smashing knees? The shake and the smashing knees. Okay, I'm not sure I know exactly what you're talking about, but I think this is it, okay, Mariana? Just face that camera. 
uh, your, your guard is facing this way. All right. So, you know, most people just put your head over there a little bit so they both pass so you can see. Okay. But most people refer to this knee right here as a uh, knee shield. I always call it the China wall. I just like the word better. But, like, it's a knee shield, right? Like, it's he's pushing me away. So if I lean in, he pushes me away. It's very hard to get past that knee. Right, so I have a option here that uh, there's many options, but this is probably my favorite one. Is you know the, the thing about this knee is that he doesn't want it too closed and he doesn't want it wide open, right? Because if it's too closed, I can smash and he can't really you know defend anymore. He can't really push me away. And if it's too open, I'm going to get underneath it. So he normally keeps it like right in the middle. So my job is to try to use that against him. So what I'm going to do is I'm in combat stance here. My foot's on the ground. My knee is on his the inside of his leg but i'm not leaning on it okay if you're like oh i'm just going to try to hurt him with this you're really losing your balance my weight is mostly on my uh, on my feet right now especially with my shoulder in this case i am leaning so i'm shifting my weight from my legs to my upper body i'm going to feed the lapel to my right hand the more lapel i have the better all right what this does it makes it harder for him to shrimp not impossible but he's got to fight the collar as well a lot of people go for the arm here, which is not a too deep. And next thing you know, you start attacking my arm, right? Everyone's been caught in this arm bar before. So I normally reach around the collar, close to the collarbone. And now notice that my shoulder is very heavy on his leg. As I walk out, I drop my shoulder as heavy as I can on that leg. It's almost like a Charlie horse. I'm supposed to be putting so much pressure on that leg. He can't really open up his knees anymore. And now I'm going to pass this turn. I'm going to pass by cross face. Now, I've been using this cross face a lot, um, you know, maybe sorry, like maybe two years ago. And I, every time I'm passing, like he started turning into me and I force him to look away. So once again, and I force him to look away by opening my, my wrist into his face. And what that does, it flattens out my opponent, right? By forcing him to look away, he can't turn into me anymore. If he can't turn into me, he can't shrimp. That's like... It is mandatory, right, for them to be able to shrimp is that they can see you. To look in the opposite direction, it just doesn't work, okay? So that's one of my favorites right there. Okay, Martin Hanika. Uh, Rob, miss you, brother. Question, during this quarantine for big guys like me, would you recommend to gain muscle, lose weight, get more flexible? What direction should we go when we train at home? It's a, you know, y y there's, there's not a – in terms of fitness, right, like, you know, you, you there's no such thing as, oh, you're going to only lose weight or you're going to only get mu get muscle. Like, they both happen at the same time. The more muscle mass you have, the more calories you're burning, right? That means less fat, okay? So as you put on muscle, you're going to be burning fat as well because you're burning calories. Now, there's some guys that they gain mass muscle mass and they don't lose fat. It's because they're eating a lot. Like you see like the, the power lifters, like they have that built. Like they have so much muscle, but they're like have, have a layer of fat is thick under the tummy too. And that's because they eat so much in order because they're for them, it's important they stay heavy because they're worried about lifting heavy weights and their weight is going to help them in that regard, right? But, um, you know, generally speaking, I, I you know, I, they kind of go together. What I would recommend is, you know, what's the purpose? Is it for jujitsu? Is it for well-being? Is it for... You know, general health, they just want to look good, you know, and then you make a decision based off of that. Like some people that want to look good, they want to have like really little fat on them. I never cared that much. I never cared to have abs. So to me, it's like, all right, I'll, I would rather just, it's more, it was more about jujitsu performance. That's mainly why I worked out, you know, and later for health reasons, you know, it's important to stay active. So I work out for a little bit of all those reasons, but for, for the longest time, it was all about performance. So, that's uh, that's what I would recommend is that you find what is it that you really feel that you need, what is it that you're looking for, and focus on that. If it's fat burn, if you just want to get leaner, it's not just a train. A big part of it is the diet. Like that's very important. Like most of the work is going to be done in the kitchen uh, more than on the mats, believe it or not. Like your body is a calorie burning machine. You're burning calories like crazy just by – you're sleeping and you're burning a ton of calories. There's no way out of it. It's just that, you know, it depends on how much you eat in relation to how many calories your body burns, right? There's normally an equation that goes somewhat like this in terms of diet and fitness. Uh, you have to burn, for you to lose weight, you have to burn more than you, if you work out a little, you have to burn a lot. You have to, you have to eat very little, right? So if you work out a little, you have to eat very little. If you were to work out a lot, you're, you're allowed to, to work, to, uh, uh, to eat more, right? So you have to balance these things out. So there's no way you're going to work out a little and eat a lot and not gain weight.
right? It has to be the opposite. You work out a lot and you eat less, and that's how you're going to be, you know, uh, uh, getting leaner. It's just it's it's simple, but like nutrition to me is not that complicated. It comes down to like very it's it's just math. Like more too many calories, not enough working out. You guess what's going to happen? Of course, you're going to gain weight. You know, and if you want to lose weight, it's the opposite. You got to work out a lot and eat very little. Yeah. All right. How, uh, this is from Nightbot. How do you end up choosing who gets tagged along in your live videos? Did he volunteer or do you have to snatch him and drag him in there? <laughs> this is a, it's a very good question. Uh, I drag him. I don't give him a choice. I make him like, listen, you guys are going to show up and that's it. I keep him on a rotation. So you know, I don't put too much on any of them, but we keep him rotating. Okay, So I think it's Max's turn next time. If you want to volunteer, DM me and then you can be a volunteer too and you get to get choked out. Absolutely for free. All right, keep Alan. How do you compare jujitsu today to your time competing? It's a good question, man. Like the biggest, and people think that a lot of like, oh, it's the it's the technique that's changed dramatically. And I, I've never really thought it was a technique because obviously the technique changes, but it's always been changing. Like, and you're available. That technique is made available to you, so it's not more difficult in the sense that you have to, you know, think of new techniques because it's constantly being presented to you. So. Your ability to absorb new techniques is, is is always stays the same because the game evolves and so do you and everyone else is evolving. So more information is available. So even though there has been a technical revolution, it's it's always been the case. There's always been a technical revolution. It's that that hasn't changed at all. That the big change to me is the number of competitors. You know, before you would win like four or five fights to win a, a world title. You know, maybe like. Five was normal, like six was pushing, and now you have seven. That means the number of competitors has doubled. Uh, so if you look at the number of people that entered the, the Masters World Championships in Brazil, when like in the late 90s or early 2000s, and now, and it's probably more than tripled, just to give you an idea of how many more competitors we have. So that's been the biggest difference. As far as the technique, like I said, it's always been improving. Like it's it's normal. Like you just have more techniques every day, and but you know have more access to information too so it's it's the bar has been raised for everyone equally so nothing if the bar is raised for everyone equally then it's really the same the biggest differential is the number of competitors like it's harder in that sense because you have more competition because it's become like a global sport whereas you know when i was competing it was more like brazil us a little bit from europe a little bit from japan you know like europe was like like very few competitors from europe it was mainly like us and and brazil and I'd say like 80% Brazil, really, and then 20% the rest of the world combined, just to give an idea. And if you watch the world's in California, you know, even though it's in California, I'd say like maybe half the competitors are American, the other half are from the rest of the world. So that has been the biggest change, in my opinion. All right. Uh, okay, Raymond McKay. When pulling half guard with larger people, I sometimes get flattened and end up with head and shoulders on opposite side of their body. Than my legs. How do I escape from that? Let me one, one more time. Let me read this again. When pulling half guard with larger people, I sometimes get flattened and end up with my head and shoulders on the opposite side of their body than my legs. I have a horrible time visualizing this, guys. End up with head and shoulders on the opposite side of their body than my legs. How do I escape from there? Well, I, I, I'm having a hard time picturing what the position you're talking about, but if you're pulling half guard, is that you're doing? You're pulling half guard. Uh, I'll show you a little tip that was like I guarantee to pull you underneath them. It's very simple. Uh, I would have to see really how you're pulling half guard for me to correct. It's very difficult to do this online. Uh, but I'll give you a way of pulling half guard that's going to solve all your problems. This is underrated. Very few. In fact, I can't remember the last time I saw someone use it. For some reason, no one used it, but it's it's very effective. So, so instead of like you know just gripping the collar and sitting, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to reach for the belt. Like people always defend the collar, right? The sleeve. Everyone's always grip better control than the collar or the sleeve. If I pull the sleeve, like, like okay, I, look how much control I have over his body. If I have a collar, I have a little bit more. But when I have the belt, I have the center of gravity. Do the difference. Yeah. I have a lot. You can't stop that, right? So you could fake this right here just to distract him up here and reach for the belt. When I sit to guard, look, I'm going to sit. It's not just the pull of my right arm. It's gravity pulling me down. You see how it, I, I force him on top of me? You know, this is this could be done for a deep half guard or for a coyote half guard, depending on what you're looking for. So if I'm in here, there's nothing stopping me from pulling here. Oh. 
And it might put me straight into a dog fight, not even a half guard. So you're already on your knees. You don't really sit on the ground when that happens. It's an idea. It's not the only idea, but it's something very underused in, uh, um, in jiu-jitsu. I never understood. This is one of those things where no one does it, right, because no one does it. Because no one does it, it can't be good. If everyone's doing it, it must be great, right? It's kind of like follow the leader, herd mentality, and we all behave that way. You got to be careful with these things because just because no one does it doesn't mean it's good. And just because everyone's doing it doesn't mean it's good either, right? I'm sorry. Just because no one's doing it doesn't mean it's not good. To me, the belt, I'll give you another example. If I'm playing guard, this is like one of like, I, I stand up. This is a great way of pulling guard because it's very difficult to break that grip. It doesn't break very easily. So if you start backing out, start, try to like go Toriando around me. Like I can always pull myself in. He can't really stop me. It doesn't matter where I am. If I have the belt, like I have could look at that. Look at that. Like sit on the ground. Look how much control I have over him. Look. Like I'm not even trying hard here. And it's not a matter of strength. It's a matter of body weight. I'm connected to his center of gravity. And he can't stop me. So when he pulls my lower back, I come forward. You know, I come forward. When I sit, when I pull guard, what happens is my body weight is coming down. So I, you know, I force him on top of me. Really good for single X as well. You can set up single X's from there to just like really learn how to use your body weight as a form of pulling. It's an idea. It's not the only way of pulling half guard, but you never see people use it. And I think it'd be effective for that reason, right? Like it's it's a big surprise. And like I said, no one ever fights for the belt. By the way, <laughs> I would love to. I had like a number of seminars planned for uh, um, March, April, June, July. I was booked all the way through August. And uh, it all stopped. It all stopped. Um, you know, we don't know when, but I'm going to start booking soon. I have in my head in Vegas, we'll be they get back to normal June or July. That's kind of what I'm thinking. But it might go on for longer, you know. I, I don't know what to say, guys. I try to stay positive, but I, I'm in a worse situation than most people in reality. I am 100% dependent on jiu-jitsu to live, one. Uh, I don't have any source of income. I don't know how to do anything else. That's the, that's the downside of doing jiu-jitsu for a living is that you don't really learn how to do anything else over the course of your life. I don't have any other skills. And um, other than that, you know, I, I just signed a lease on a building in, in, in Henderson, too, and it's empty. I got zero students. and. Pretty soon, I got to start paying rent on it, so I'm not excited about that. So, yeah, seminars will definitely be something I, I plan on doing. I'm kind of excited about getting back on the road, too. It's been a while since I've traveled. You know, I'm, nor I'm not used to that. I'm used to traveling at least once a month, and it's been almost two now. So I can't wait. We'll, we'll get on the phone there, Billy, and we'll talk, and then uh, we'll, we'll book something for Portland uh, as soon as this is back to normal. Okay? All right. Daniel Pakin, hello, coach. Can you show your favorite way to off-balance opponent from half guard, which doesn't want to fight and is really hard to move home uh, to move home any direction? Okay. Uh, when you say half guard, I'm assuming you're talking uh, uh, like the regular half guard, like the the underhook half guard, because half guard is really I call it the coyote because you're fighting for that underhook, right? It's the one Lucas Leche does, or the deep half guard, the one that Bernardo Faria does. They're both half guard. They they kind of flow together pretty well, but they're the attacks are a little bit different, okay? Or very different, really. But what to do when this guy just doesn't want to engage? One thing you can do is it, well, it depends on where you're at. If you have the underhook, right? You have to be aggressive about it. You got to be coming up. The problem is when you don't have the underhook. The problem is when I'm really here, which is really more of an open guard. It's not really a half guard yet. Okay. I'm assuming this is what you're talking about, right? He's sitting on his heels. He's not trying to sit on yet. He's not trying to come forward. He's being very defensive. One thing I do a lot here is I'm always fighting for this sleeve because what anchors him in position is this hand. So two things here, pocket grip on the sleeve, and I give him my thumb. You'd be surprised how many people will grab that thumb. I thank you. And then I grab his hand. And if he doesn't grab the thumb, it doesn't matter. I'll be – I just want this right here. This is not illegal, okay? This is illegal. But if I grab all four of them, it's not illegal. And what I do is I don't let him anchor his hand. So if he wants to hold on to my gi now, I don't let him, okay? So what I'm going to be doing here is I move his arm to that half of my body just long enough for me to let go of the hand and grip the armpit, okay? You see that right there? Now, normally what happens here is they begin to pull back. They try to – when they pull back, I got to sit up. And if they don't, even if he just stays where he's at, I'm just going to start kicking and moving across. 
So what happens is, like, what is Orlando going to do there? He can't stop me from coming up, right? I call it the – it's really like a, a modified arm drag. I call it the, the drag fly because you're arm dragging and you're in the butterfly at the same time. It's a, it's a modified – arm drag. I do this with a lot of heavy people too. Like heavyweights, I normally play open guard or I do this right here. Cross sleeve and armpit. And I'll keep one foot on his hip. right? And I'm always scooting to my left. So I do this a lot so he can't really square up with me. So if he tries to square up with me, he's stuck. right? Very common things for him to try to stand up. That's what Orlando wants to do. I can feel it. He wants to stand up, stand up. I'm going to follow into a single because I still have his sleeve and he can't even defend that. right? So Moving the arm across is a great way of getting around that problem. It's not always easy because he's going to be hiding the armpit the second he sees what you're doing. That's why I always recommend this first because if I reach right away and he senses it, he's going to grip onto my collar. And if he holds onto my collar here, I can't move his arm across anymore. So I always block the hand first until I'm ready to what? Sit up. And I grip that armpit. There's a little, it's a very solid grip here underneath his armpit. You see how my hand fits in there? I'm not doing this. This is garbage. This is going to open. I have to fit my hand behind. There's a little pocket there. See it? So now I'm here. It doesn't matter what he does. Like, let's say you can have your knees like you were. Say, have both your knees. Yes. Like, it does. Like, if I say go here, who do you think is going to win? He can't, he can't even fall. I'm pushing his hand into the ground. I'm like planking on that right hand as I pull myself up. And a lot of times, this, depending on his weight, it can turn into a wrestling match. What I'm completely okay with. Because uh, I, I'm completely okay with because the uh, um, you know if if maybe that's what I want. If he's a heavyweight guy, like a heavy guy, you want that because they're not going to be able to stand up in time. When they're smaller, they'll be able to stand up, but then you should be able to out wrestle them. So it's a size thing too. Like people are heavy, they're always going to be hard to take down, but they're slower to stand up too. So I should be able to get to the back before they stand up. And lighter people, you know, if you're heavier, you should have an advantage out wrestling them. You know, broadly speaking. No. All right. How do you okay? How do you feel the jujitsu representatives at MMA, Kip Allen? Um, you know, I'm not too optimistic about. It. On one hand, you know, there are more practitioners than ever, right? I used to think that Damian Maya was the last of the Mohicans, and then Rodolfo was doing well. It seems like Gary Tone is going to do well. I think he'll do. I think he'll do very well in Asia. Um. But, like, the pure jiu-jitsu practitioners, I mean, Damian Maya really is the last one in that regard, maybe Rodolfo. Everyone's, like, becoming better and better at striking. They've moved towards striking a lot. But I, there are two problems. Like, jiu-jitsu, there's a bit of a split in jiu-jitsu, in case you guys haven't noticed. And there's, like, the, the IBJJF slash lapel community, and there's a submission only. I only know how to butt scoot and heel hook community, right? Like, these... And then there are exceptions. Not everyone fits in these two categories. But, like, you can see technically these things are – this is what's happening. You're getting on one side guys that don't know how to wrestle. They don't know how to sweep. They don't know how to fight for position. They don't know how to, you know, do anything other than attack the legs from their butts and hope for an overtime where I can escape an armbar really fast. That's one category. And the other category, you get these guys that pull guard. They wrap you up in a 50-50 with a lapel, and you're stuck for 10 minutes straight. Right? And they win on advantage. Now, which one of these two is going to do well in MMA? Neither, right? Because MMA is about getting on top of someone, fighting for position, fighting for that mount, ground and pound, getting to the back, choking them. When they try to stand back up, you take them back down. And at the, the, the technical revolution that has existed in jiu-jitsu, both gi and no gi over the last five years, ten years, it, they've been away from MMA, not towards MMA, away from it. All right. Of course, that if you found guys that knew how to wrestle and that did well at attacking heel hooks, that would be very good. That's, you would want that. Of course, if you had guys that are very skilled at IBJJF rule set with like lots of takedowns and a very aggressive passing game, very good top control, that would, of course, that's beneficial. But a lapel is not going to help you in a fight any more than butt scooting is. Right. So, you know, I'm looking at the, 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 the next generation of jiu-jitsu practitioners, and I think that they're moving away from jiu-jitsu in the martial arts sense of the word. Um, you know, it is what it is. Like, I'm, you know, I've tried to change people's mind on this, but people don't seem to care because they're perfectly content with jiu-jitsu being as it is. Jiu-jitsu is, is a world of its own. Like, you don't have to fight MMA to be successful in life financially. You know, 20 years ago, there were no options. Like you had to leave jiu-jitsu in May if you ever wanted to pay the bills. 
But today it's not the case anymore. Jiu Jitsu has grown so much. There's plenty of room for development. There's plenty of room for growth inside of uh, um, of, uh, uh, of, of Jiu Jitsu as well. So I think that the tendency is for Jiu Jitsu to become more like Judo. It's a sport of its own. And less and less people transition into MMA, which was almost the norm 15, 20 years ago. I think that's going to be very more and more rare occurrences in the future. Guys, just so the, uh, everyone from uh, Instagram knows, we're only answering the questions that are on our YouTube channel. Okay, Drysdale, uh, BJJ Academy, Online Academy. Uh, subscribe, and then you can ask the questions there. Uh, it's just easier to respond to the questions on one platform over two platforms. So I apologize, okay? This is only for YouTube. Okay. Uh, next questions here. Um, okay, I'll answer one question from, from YouTube, uh, uh, Instagram, because we ran out of questions on YouTube. Is there any help you can show me to pass this defense? That would be awesome, Sensei. Which defense are you talking about? I need to know. You're more specific on the questions, guys. Okay, is Neon Belly good for MMA or too unstable? You want my honest opinion on Neon Belly? I think it's the most overrated position in all of jiu-jitsu. That's my take on it. Because in our last question, we ran out of time here. But Neon Belly is not going to control gi or no gi, if you ask me. I think it's if you're a heavier, stronger opponent, you can do that. And then, you know, a lot of times we're really talking about the weight thing. That's what's that's what allows the control. It's, it's the, the fact that you can over, overpower your opponent. But everything being equal... If you pay close attention to jiu-jitsu competitions, the point that is scored the least amount of times is the neon belly. Less than mount, less than you know, passing the guard, less than sweeping, less than takedown, less than back take. The, the point that is least scored in all of jiu-jitsu is the neon belly. What does that tell you? I think that's suggestive. I think that says something. It's not great control. It's a great transition from you know being side control to standing or from standing into side control. I use it all the time to transition. But as far as controlling someone there, it almost requires the other person on the bottom being very tired or you just being a lot stronger, a lot more powerful, a lot heavier than them. Other than that, it's not great control, in my opinion, even less so in MMA. There's a reason why you don't see it in the UFC. If it were an effective way of controlling someone in the UFC, it would be used. Keeping in mind.